Good morning. It's good to see you all. Appreciate the presence of each and every one of you. We had a good meeting last week with Princeton. If you missed any of those lessons, it's on our website. We encourage you to take a listen to all of them. It was an edifying, encouraging series. Um, it's good to see so many visitors with us this morning. You're an honored guest, and we welcome you here. Uh, some of you new, some of you old faces. Not that you're old. Uh, <laughs> if you open your Bibles this morning, we'll be starting in Acts, the 17th chapter. Acts chapter 17 is where we'll be beginning this morning. If you go back on what we have been, what I've been preaching on, what we've been studying the last couple months, we've, I've been trying to devote uh, the third or fourth Sunday of the month to an aspect or something related to salvation. And in January, we considered what it means to have saving faith. In February, we looked at um, uh, repentance. And a couple months ago, we looked at confession as well. And that was a challenging lesson, not because of content, but because I didn't know I could put together a lesson on confession. You know, it seemed pretty straightforward, but it was a needed topic, and we wanted to consider it. Uh, This morning, uh, we want to consider how baptism fits in God's plan of salvation. And we're not, this isn't necessarily going to be a lesson per se on baptism, but how baptism fits in with God's plan to save man. Uh, in Acts chapter 17, as I said just a moment ago, when Paul is preaching on Mars Hill uh, at the Areopagus, he is making this point at the end of his sermon about how God has determined and has a plan to save man. He gets to the conclusion here. He says, therefore, in verse 30 of Acts 17, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to all men that all people everywhere should repent because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. Paul is preaching that plan of salvation on Mars Hill. Paul preached that plan of salvation in many other places throughout his travels. As we conclude our stay of the book of Acts a few weeks ago, we saw how that plan of salvation was forcefully and declared to all people in all places in which the apostles and the disciples went. So as I said just a moment ago, this morning we're going to be considering that plan of salvation, how God fits baptism or how baptism fits into that. The first thing we need to get out of the way is we need to understand that salvation is conditional. This goes against the grain of much of the religious world because they they teach a, a false idea that salvation is unconditional. You have to do nothing to receive it, that it just happens to you unbeknownst to yourself, um, that you won't find that in the scriptures. And just real quickly, because I know many of us might have a knee-jerk reaction at that phrase, how is salvation conditional? Well, conditions are simply set of requirements, set before a thing can come to pass or be fulfilled or can be done. You know, it's pretty obvious we, from the scriptures, we even covered this morning, it's not going to be on the lesson, but if you want to just turn to the Gospel of Mark real quick, God sets conditions for himself or has conditions before he'll do a certain thing. You know, in the Gospel of Mark, we read this morning, Mark chapter 1 and verse 15, the first words of Jesus in Mark's account, Jesus said the time is fulfilled. So a certain amount of conditions had been met in order for him to come and preach the Gospel. Another example from the book of Hebrews in Hebrews 11 verse 7. We think about Noah... He's a favorite type in in the New Testament, but you look in Hebrews 11, and we're looking at verse 7. The Hebrew writer writes here to encourage these Christians by giving them all these great practical examples of living faith. He said, By faith, Noah, being warned by God about things not yet seen, in reverence prepared an ark for the salvation of his household, by which he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness, which is according to faith. So let's think about that real quick. If Noah, it took faith, don't get me wrong, Noah had to believe God, believe exactly what he said. But had Noah not built the ark, no salvation. If Noah had not brought in all the animal kind, well, there might have been salvation for him and his household, but There would be nothing to eat afterwards, and you and I would not have steak. 
Um, Noah had to meet those conditions. It was not any less graceful or any less by faith because there was conditions. It was by God's grace that Noah was even forewarned of God ahead of time. It was by God's grace that he gave him the plans and the instructions on how to build the ark and save his household. We understand this in a more practical terms as a human illustration. Uh, you know, when I was getting ready to go to college, the count, uh, counselor school always made mention about the free money of scholarships. Well, in a technical sense, yeah, it's free. I don't have to pay it back, any of that. But you have to meet the conditions. And when I was going through all those scholarships, I realized, wow, I meet none of these conditions. <laughs> and I learned really hard, really quick, of what my parents said to me when I asked, after, I think it was after I asked my parents, do I have a college fund? And after they laughed for a solid two minutes, <laughs> they said, no, you're on your own for that. In fact, you, you won't get anything when we die because we got nothing. You might get our debt, but... <laughs> we understand this principle in our areas of our life. It does not make salvation any less of a gift. It doesn't make salvation any less amazing. But even in our study of the Gospel of Matthew, one more point before we move on. Jesus said pretty clearly in Matthew 5, in verse 3, the very first teaching on the Sermon on the Mount, that we have to be poor in spirit if we are to enter the kingdom. That is a condition. God has no room for proud, proudful people in his service. And proudful people can't enter the kingdom. So what are the conditions we read in scripture? There's actually, relatively speaking, very few. You consider how many conditions there might be for scholarships, and this is, this is very few. Um, we read that faith is absolutely required for salvation. Jesus said in John chapter 3 and verse 16 that whoever would believe in the Son of God would have life or have eternal life. And he continues on that, he would, that those who would not believe in the Son does not have life, but the wrath of God abides on him. In John the 8th chapter, where we want to turn here, in John chapter 8 and verse 24... John made it, uh, Jesus made it very clear here. John 8, verse 24. Therefore I said to you that you will die your sins unless you believe that I am. You will die in your sins. So for Jesus, you had to believe in him. That's, that's the foundation. That's the starting point. You know, if I don't believe in a thing, I'm not going to act on, uh, you know, trust in that thing. But to put it in more practical terms, if I don't believe in parachutes, say I'm a parachute denier, that it's a crazy conspiracy by the Air Force and Southwest to sell parachutes. You know, when have you ever met a person who actually used a parachute? Well, there's one here this morning, but uh, if I'm that committed to no parachutes and my flight from Southwest is falling in you know, this is a horrible situation, but somehow we can't make an emergency landing, and I need to jump out. And I, since I don't believe in them, I'm not going to take that parachute. And I'm not going to do anything to save myself. I'm like, I'm just going to jump out. Because parachutes aren't natural. God wants us to fly, he gives us wings. You, know, you can see where people can get on that. But if you don't believe in Jesus, it doesn't matter what else he has to say to you. At all. If you don't have that convicting faith that the Jesus of Nazareth is the Christ, he died for your sins, was risen on the third day, and now is big, beckoning the whole world to come to him, close the book. You know, I have studied with people kind of like that. They would not, they, they wanted to get the benefits of God, but they didn't believe that Jesus was who he said to be, that he was just simply another good moral teacher. Faith is absolutely essential. Hence why the Hebrew writer says in Hebrews 11 and verse 6, that without faith it is impossible to please him. For one must believe that God is and he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. 
Now, if you don't have faith, well, the rest of the lesson does not apply. But faith is a starting point. Faith is the core. Faith is the engine that drives everything else. But Jesus also had to say that repentance was pretty important to salvation. In Luke, the 13th chapter, in verse 3, in Luke chapter 13, in verse 3, Jesus teaching here, In fact, it's pretty important he says it twice here in, the, in these couple verses. Let's start in verse 2. And Jesus said to them, Do you suppose that these Galileans were greater sinners than the other Galileans because they suffered this fate? Referring to those who the tower fell on. Um, excuse me, no, this referring to Galileans in general. He says in verse 3, I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or do you suppose that those 18... Uh, on whom the tower fell in Siloam uh, and killed them were worse the culprits than all the men who live in Jerusalem. I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Now, repentance is simply a change in mind concerning your former manner of life and changing it to what God would have you to do. So Jesus is saying very clearly that unless one repents of their lives, their sins, there's no salvation. And he's making the point of these Galileans and the, the men who the tower fell on in Siloam. Because the Jews had this weird idea that only bad things happen to you because you sinned. And Jesus very clearly showed that in other parts of the gospel where, especially the, the lame and the blind man, that sometimes bad things happen to people because we live in a fallen world. But he was making the point that if you think you're so good because nothing bad's happened to you, I'm going to tell you right now that you need to repent of your sins just as much as those, those other people need to repent. And unless you repent, you're going to perish in, like they, they did. It takes faith to repent. In fact, repentance is kind of that first test of faith. Are you actually, do you believe Jesus enough to say that your manner of life as you're currently living it outside of him is wrong and needs to be changed? Do I have the faith to turn away from my old life? Jesus also said that one needs to confess him. This also involves faith. But as Jesus said in Matthew, the 10th chapter, Matthew chapter 10, verses 32 and 33, teaching on the meaning of discipleship. He says this here, Therefore, everyone who confesses me before men, I will also confess him before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny him before my Father who is in heaven. Now, he's talking about those who are disciples. I understand this. That's why Paul, speaking on the same thing, says in Romans 10, verses 9 and 10, that confession is intricately related to salvation and faith. Again, Romans chapter 10, looking at verses 9 and 10. Speaking of the word of faith in which he was preaching to them, he says in verse 9, If you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with a heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. Think about the importance of confession and salvation. It's one thing to believe a thing privately. It's one thing to me to think privately that parachutes are a conspiracy theory made up by the air, you know, air industry. And no one thinks any different if I keep that privately. But if I were to seriously say that out loud, and I was actually serious and not using it for simply a point of my sermon, y'all think I was nuts. Or if I were to say to you right now, I believe the earth is flat. It isn't, by the way. It's one thing to think a thing. It's another thing to publicly state it. You see, the type of religion, type of Christianity that the world wants right now, with all these moral debates we're having, is the Christianity that stays in its closet, is the Christianity that's confined to three hours a week or even an hour a week on Sunday, it's a Christianity that keeps its head low and its eyes 
down and doesn't say anything. The world does not want biblical Christianity because biblical Christianity requires us to publicly name Christ as Savior and not be ashamed about it. And so for the sinner coming out of their sins to be saved, they must confess Jesus as Lord in the presence of many witnesses. That's what Paul told Timothy in the first epistle, that he would fulfill his, the good confession which he made in the presence of many witnesses. It's the same reason why at a wedding we take vows to our spouses. I say that in the collective. You take vows to your spouses in the presence of many witnesses. There's accountability. You stated publicly, I believe in this. I'm going to do this. And then finally, and this is not the final point, but finally we see that baptism is spoken of in the same manner as a condition for salvation. In Matthew's Gospel, Matthew 28, verse 19, when Matthew's account of the Great Commission, right before Jesus ascends into heaven, let's actually start in verse 18 for context. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Before we get to Mark 16, verse 16, let's just note here, because Jesus has 100% total authority, there's some consequences of that as his disciples. The first one is we are to go into all the world and preach the gospel. And in doing so, we are to make disciples. Well, how do you make disciples? You baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then you teach them to observe everything that Jesus taught the original apostles that have been passed down throughout the ages through the writ of the Holy Scriptures. Now, Jesus, in Mark's account, also told them, in verse 15 and 16, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. He who is believed and has been baptized shall be saved. He who is disbelieved and shall be condemned. Now, the old beaten dead horse on this verse. He says, well, it doesn't say and does not believe. Uh, and is, excuse me. They'll, they'll read it and they'll go, well, it doesn't say and the one who it does not baptize and does not believe shall, is condemned. It doesn't say that. And you and I both know that we don't talk like that. Case in point. Um, I could say to you, that he who takes his car to get its oil changed shall get many more miles out of it. Okay? This is a contrast between brother and sister or just how people do things differently. If I take my car and get its oil changed, yeah, I'm going to get many more miles out of it. But if I do not keep up the maintenance and, take and get its oils changed, I'm not going to get many more miles out of it. The first is requirement for the second. Or the old beaten illustration, too. The man who eats and digests shall be nourished. The one who does not eat shall not be nourished. I got a crock pot full of something at home right now. Here in about 20 minutes, I'm going to start seeing getting hungry. I'm going to keep on being hungry if I don't eat. And my body will start withering if I keep on not eating. So in the text, the one who believes and that couples it and is baptized shall be saved. Let's let the text speak for itself. Now, very quickly, because I've probably belabored this longer than I needed to. And I do find it interesting that when you look in the scriptures, you find scriptures that tie baptism with each step of the plan of salvation, or each condition, if you will. It's almost as if God didn't want us to divorce any one of these things from the other. So we just read Mark 16, 16. Baptism and faith are connected together. You go over and look at Acts 2, 38. Repentance and baptism are connected together. After the crowd cried out to Peter and the rest of the apostles, what shall we do in verse 37? Peter responded to them, repent and let each one of you be baptized for the remission of your sins and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now I find this very interesting because, you know, we get people who hardly anyone who claims to be a disciple of Jesus will deny that faith is necessary. That's the favorite one, right? There's a few people that will say repentance isn't necessary but no one really takes them seriously. So yeah, well, okay, repentance is necessary. 
But you find verses where those two, they're coupled with baptism. Likewise, confession and baptism. In fact, confession was the one thing preventing the eunuch from being baptized. You look in Acts, book of Acts, in chapter 8, we're going to be around verse 35. Again, Acts chapter 8, around verse 35 here. After the eunuch asked the Bible question about the passage of Scripture he was reading in Isaiah 53, it says here, Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning from this Scripture, he preached Jesus to him. As they went along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? Now, I do find it interesting, and this makes for bad Bible reading, but let's just pause here. The text does not tell us what Philip preached other than he preached Jesus to him. But of necessity, we have to understand that baptism was preached. For this man, this eunuch, who was only reading Isaiah, had no idea about the new covenant, suddenly is exclaiming from the chariot when they come across a body of water, there, there's some water, Mr. Philip, can, can I be baptized right now? Let's continue reading. And Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And what did the eunuch say? He answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he ordered the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip as well as the eunuch, and he baptized him. So here we see confession and baptism linked together. And salvation and baptism are directly linked together. Peter, in the first epistle, uh, in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 21, speaking of Noah and the ark, and it's serving as an antitype to our salvation today, that is, it was a shadow of what God was going to do in the future. Uh, Noah and his family were saved by water in the ark, because how are they saved? They got in the ark, and they were saved from that sinful world at that time, which was destroyed by water. The water lifted them up and kept them safe from that wicked world. The ark was necessary as well. They had to be in the ark. But Peter makes a connection between Noah and the ark and our salvation today. He says in verse 21, corresponding to that, or the New King James might say uh, there is an anti-type or a type corresponding to that, he says baptism now saves you. And he's very quick to explain. There's nothing magical in the water. The rest of the verse not the removal of the dirt from the flesh, but appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of, the, of Jesus Christ, who is at the right hand of God, having gone into heaven after angels and authorities and powers have been subjected to him. Peter flatly says, baptism now saves you. Brother David Halbrook, who we're supporting up in Fairbanks, uh, they will rent a booth in the Alaskan State Fair every year. Um, and that's quite a feat because you get 18 hours plus of daylight, so the fair really just doesn't close. <laughs> but they'll rent a booth and they'll, have, they'll, they'll sit there, and what they've done is they have one Bible, a pew Bible, with 1 Peter 3.21 highlighted. And they, they don't keep it, it's not really prominent, but they have a sign that says, true or false, baptism now saves you. And you get people come in and say, well, no, the Bible doesn't teach that. And they just take them over to the scripture. And David has said people are flabbergasted. Some even think they, they doctored their own Bible. <laughs> and that's just not true. It's amazing on how God will so plainly tell us something. And many of us will, like those three monkeys, will plug our ears, close our eyes, and cover our mouths, and we just don't want to see it. So, Let's tie everything together now very quickly. When we are baptized, we're responding in faith in God's word to be baptized. When I was baptized, I, my faith was not being professed in the method or the water. My faith was being professed in Christ as my Savior. And he said, I need to be buried with him in the waters of baptism. Can't be buried with sprinkling or pouring. You're buried in immersion. In Acts 8, turning back here, verses 12 and 13, we read about the conversion of the Sumerians and Simon the sorcerer. But you look here in verses 12 and 13. Philip comes 
preaching the good news about Jesus. In verse 12, But when they believed Philip's preaching the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were being baptized, men and women alike. Even Simon himself believed. And after being baptized, he continued on with Philip, and he observed the signs and great miracles taking place, and he was constantly amazed. I like how Luke words that. Because he's telling us with Simon, too, it's like, and that guy who you thought would not obey the gospel, he obeyed the gospel. This worker and conjurer of sorcery, he repented and believed and obeyed the gospel and demonstrated his faith in God's command to be baptized for the remission of their sins, of your sins. So we respond in faith when we are baptized. We are committed fully to our repentance by crucifying our old man of sin in the waters of baptism. I was reading a writer the other day, and he was making a point about why baptism, why was baptism added as, as a condition of salvation in the New Testament. And the one point he made I thought was very good. He said it was a practical point. It was just one of practicality. It says, God knew that when a, people are ma- when a person is making such a stark break from their past life, They need a mental landmark in their minds. An event they can look back on, saying, that's the day my old life died, and that's the day I began to live. That's why I can tell you today, it's written in the front of my Bible, February 21st, 2010. Brendan Ashby died and I was raised. Christ in me. I can look back on that day as definitive proof that that's the day I entered relationship with my God. And so I, I kind of joke I have two birthdays. <laughs> it was the day I was physically born and then the day I was born again. So where some of us, there's a great many years difference for us physically. But some of you are actually almost my twin in Christ. In fact, I think Gabriel Burns and I, I think we were baptized about the same time in 2013. We're about 11 or 12 both, so She's my twin sister almost. But in Romans chapter 6, verses 3 through 7, you know, Romans is great because here we have a whole chapter Paul devotes to this event in our lives of a believer. That is so powerful, it is likened that we are, we are united with Christ in his burial, his death, burial, and resurrection. He says in verse 3, Or do you not know? That all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death. Because of this, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in the newness of life. For if we become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For he who died is freed from sin. I can change my mind regarding sin. I can maybe even start maybe trying to make some changes. But when I baptize, I fully commit to the life of repentance that Jesus calls us to live. Because I definitively kill the old man. And there is a funeral that day. There's old, dead people, you don't sit dead people in your living room chair. You bury them. And by the same power that raised Christ from the dead, we are resurrected spiritually. We, we read, we sang Rock of Ages. It speaks about, be of sin, the double cured. Sin brought death. And so there needs to be a resurrection. And baptism is that point in which that happens. You might want us to scribble in your Bibles real quick, Titus chapter 3 and verse 5 on this point. That's when the Holy Spirit descends upon us and resurrects us or brings life to our dead spirits. So we fully commit to our repentance when we're baptized. We're confessing Christ as Lord and Savior, as our only hope. Think back to 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 21, where he says, corresponding to that, baptism now saves you, not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Think about how much faith it takes to obey the gospel. Think about how much trust you have to have in God. 
Because by all earthly wisdom, being plunged in the water does nothing. By earthly wisdom. Just like in the Old Testament, by earthly wisdom, looking at a bronze serpent to heal me of a snake bite made no sense. By earthly wisdom. But what is behind the bronze serpent? What is the power in baptism? It's not the water. It's God Almighty. Who is calling all sinners to him that he may have a relationship with them. And so we confess Christ as our only means of salvation. And it's by virtue of the crucifixion and resurrection that we can have spiritual life today. And when we are baptized... Finally, just I want to throw these points in. We are clothed with Christ. We're washed in his blood. We're cleansed from our sins. And we have newness of life. Because it's at that point that God cures us of the double ills of sin. We are justified before him. And we are resurrected. The blood of Jesus is applied to us. The Holy Spirit descends upon us to resurrect us. And we are fully put into the body of Christ. In Galatians, the third chapter, Paul, dealing with all sorts of weird ideas about how to be saved, forcefully refutes it all there in that book of Galatians, that you can't earn it, you can't indebt God to you. It's solely by your faith in him and his grace. And there's a question that comes up for the Jews that he's writing to, well, why the law? Well, he said the law was a, was a tutor to train a nation to bring about the Christ, and it, it pointed to Jesus. But now that Jesus has come, he says in verse 23, verse 24, we are now justified by faith. So he says in verse, 25, uh, verse 26, because we're all sons of God uh, through faith in Christ Jesus. This happened because all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. That's where Paul said that happens is baptism. is when we're put into the body and we're clothed with Christ. Paul, uh, the Apostle Paul was told before he became a Christian by Ananias that as he had just heard the gospel, Ananias goes, why do you delay? Arise and be baptized, washing away your sins, calling upon his name. And as we just read in Romans 6 and verse 4 a few moments ago, that we have new life when we are raised from the waters of baptism. I have not used this chart in probably four or five years, but it's a chart that was at the end of every sermon growing up, and the preacher did that intentionally to help us all memorize what must I do to be saved. And I think over the years, perhaps I understood it wrong or Maybe we sometimes can get a wrong understanding or not understand it fully of this chart. You might have heard as the five steps of salvation, the plan, whatever, you know. We in the church love our five-step things or, or five, five charts or a list of five things, you know, five acts of worship, five steps of salvation. And sometimes we can see these as unrelated, non-connected things we do. But hopefully this morning I've, I've ad- adequately conveyed and, and taught, and hopefully we've seen the connections, that these are not separate things. These are all interwoven. And these are all scriptures we quoted this morning. If I have faith in God, in Christ and what he did, that means I should believe his message about repentance. Recognize that my sins made his death on the cross necessary. That if I have faith in God, I've repented my sins, and I should have no problem confessing him as my Lord before men. And finally, I should have the trust and the belief in God's word. And what Jesus said, that the one who believed in him and is baptized shall be saved. The one who does not believe shall be condemned. If you're here this morning, you have not done this. There is water ready, and we... There'll be a moment of time in just a moment for you to come forward and make your life right with God. But for those who are present this morning who are Christians, who have done this, it's not too late if you're not right with God. You can be restored to the faith this morning. You can seek the prayers of the congregation.
John wrote to a group of Christians in 1 John 1, 9 that God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins when we repent and confess of them. Or maybe you are looking for a solid church home and you are a faithful Christian and you would like to be identified with the congregation here. Uh, whatever, if you have any spiritual need, please, won't you come as Harry Sanden sing the song that's been selected? <laughs> 